you were part of some really good teams with LSU in the 90s. Of course, LSU had good teams in the 2000s. But, I mean, this year, you know, preseason number one just about everywhere. When was the last time you saw this much hype around an LSU team kind of going into the season? Yeah, it's been a while, you know, uh, the, some of the teams before me and then, you know, soon after and then while I was there, it was kind of expected you'd be in that top five. But, uh, you know, they, they've had some teams here in the in the last few years that were ranked highly, but then, you know, didn't maybe live up to expectations. So, uh, but yeah, I don't know if there's ever been a team since social media is such a part of it where there's been such talk and just how great they are and so many great players. So uh, I'm sure those guys would agree with me. We're ready to just forget about all that and get on the field and start playing. So I'm excited about Friday. What is that like when, when you're on a roster that you know has a lot of talent kind of going into it in the in, into the season? What's that mindset like as a player kind of playing on some of those teams? Well, I think you get a lot of confidence, you know, um, just from the fact that you know other teams are going to come in realizing that there's a little bit of an intimidation factor. You know, these guys, a lot of them have been successful before. You know, they've got some, some experience. So, I, I mean, I think they're going to hit the ground running and, and start off well. Um, who knows? The, the other thing is everybody in the SEC is good, so it's not like it's a cakewalk. But, uh, you know, to, I think to start the season off, these guys – you know, Jay Johnson does a great job. I, I heard him use the analogy. It's kind of like you're, you're a firefighter. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to run into that building. You can't be timid. You got to just go in there, do your job, get the feet people and bring them out. And uh, that's kind of how he's looking at it because there is a fire of, of media attention and uh, they're embracing it and getting ready to go play starting Friday night and, you know, take it from there. What is it about Coach Jay Johnson, obviously going into his second season, but really this offseason, bringing in a bunch of, of transfers, uh, having another great recruiting class, but also bringing in veteran people to his coaching staff. What has he done in that short time here to kind of get those expectations back to, to being LSU number one? I mean, that's just it. I think he's done so much. Um, now it's not just recruiting, you know, guys out of high school, but it's getting transfers that are going to help you immediately and then you know the big coaching moves that are going to have guys that are going to help people to be at their best um you know I, I think he's definitely done what they need to do because that's a coach's job is to put you in the best position to win the players have to do the the action obviously but uh you know i i think he's doing a great job and He's had a team before, before he came to LSU, that made it to the finals of the College World Series, so you know he knows what it takes. So obviously one of the key players to this team will be Dylan Cruz. Uh, coming out of high school was the best player to go to college from the high school level. When Dylan Cruz leaves LSU, likely after this season, will he go down as one of the best to ever put on the purple and gold jersey? I think so. Um, you know, what I think people need to realize is, it, due to some of the stuff with COVID, in a regular, you know, cycle, he probably would have never got gone to college to play in the first place. You know, he was that high of a of a, a prospect with the major league guys. But the fact that he came here and that we get to, you know, watch him in an LSU uniform for three years is, is really a treat for all of us. So, you know, he's preseason projected to be the player of the year. You know, it doesn't get much better than that. Whether he, he plays up to that or, or not, that's kind of irrelevant. But uh, he's definitely a great player, and I think he will be remembered as one of the the best to come through Baton Rouge. What's cool about Cruz is, you know, Cruz is, like you said, the preseason hype is there with him. He has all the intangibles, right. everything you need as an athlete. But with him, you know, he's probably going to go project the number one right now to the Pittsburgh Pirates, a team that you played for in your major league career. Right. But you look at a guy like Dylan Cruz, is there anything left for him to prove in college before he kind of gets ready for the major leagues? Is there much left for him to prove? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I don't see him as the type of player to just kind of rest on his morals and what he's done before. I think he's, you know, trying to expand his game, be a better outfielder, be a better base runner. And, you know, he looks bigger, stronger, you know, as far as, you know, power numbers and just average. I mean, that's what a five-tool player is. You can really do it all. And uh, I, I think, you know, Jay does a great job of the team concept. And even though you may have a Todd Walker or Ben McDonald on the team, the goal is not to get them to the highest draft position. The goal is to win a national championship. So uh, everybody's on that same page. You talk about the power. You got to talk about Tommy White. You yeah. know, I mean, that is a – you talk about the transfers that came in. Obviously, Paul Skeens is one, but Tommy White is going to be a monster. 27 home runs last year as a freshman. This isn't the days of gorilla ball anymore, right, right. where you normally see 40 home runs in a year. But do you see him being a guy that can just continue 
to, to, to show that type of power, especially going up against SEC type opponents? I think so. You know, the SEC pitching, um, you know, obviously is probably the best conference in the nation in baseball. So, uh, but, you know, he's, he's hit against good pitching in, in, where he was before in the ACC. So, uh, you know, I, I think as far as power numbers, uh, I wouldn't expect a big drop off, you know, plus how are you going to pitch around him? You've got other guys around him that they have to, you know, be afraid of as well. So I think he's going to get his pitching. And, you know, hopefully he's he feels like he doesn't have to do too much. Just be himself, and I think he'll have a great year in, in LSU. You know, you just think off the top of your head, you have Dylan Cruz, Trey Morgan, Gavin Dugas got to be thrown into the mix. Uh, mm -hmm. Jordan Thompson, especially against a right-hander, you know, he, he's dangerous. Tommy White's there. Yeah, Josh uh, Pearson. Josh Pearson and uh, Joe Bear, right. you know. So you kind of go down the roster. It's like it's hard to find – one guy who's an out and you know we talked about last year and years past one through six was extremely dangerous in the lineup but you know seven through nine that's kind of where there was some drop off right. this year there really doesn't seem to be that sort of drop off in the lineup yeah and i think that's a key because the further you get along you know you talk about postseason you know that was always our biggest you know goal was to have one through nine where there's not a there's not a drop off you know so you can score on the bottom of the order obviously at the top of the order as well so uh, you know, I think they've addressed all of that and Jay Johnson's biggest worry may be trying to figure out how to get all these guys some playing time because I mean they've got a lot of guys that can play and uh, would be starting anywhere else but you know it's you can't you only have nine spots you can put in the lineup but. Uh, you know, I think he'll figure out what, what it needs to be done and uh, they'll all gel together. One of those guys is Ethan Fry. You know, right. this time last year we were talking about him at Rose Pine and thinking what he could possibly do at LSU. Obviously, so far in the scrimmages, he's showing his power. Usually when they show the highest exit velos of the game, he's one of the guys that's definitely there. And, and he's played a bunch of different positions around the field so far. I, I, I see him as a guy that, you know, is going to, his bat's going to put him in the lineup some way, shape, or form. Is that what you kind of see as well? Well, I think kind of in this preseason, you already see a little of that because, you know, you hear they have him working at catcher and first base, but he's hitting so well and hitting home runs in these games before the season even started. Next thing you know, they, they're working him into the outfield, you know, and, and that's the thing with baseball. If you hit well enough, they'll find a place for you. You know, when I was there, a guy named Todd Walker was playing second base. Well, I was the backup second baseman, but I, I proved I could hit well enough. They put me in left field. I had never played outfield before. So uh, I think that's a testament to just how well the coaches think of him, the fact that they're letting him work into a position that maybe he's never played before. I love how you said it, a guy named Todd Walker, huh? A guy, like <laughs> one of the best, really. But, right. you know, for you, making that switch to the outfield, how tough is that? Is, is it tough at all, you know, going from a position – you played infield your whole life and now you're kind of being axed because of your bat to go play a position you never played before. Is there an adjustment level, like a, a major adjustment level for that? Yeah, there is. You know, you, you do the repetitions in practice, but until you get in a game with people in the stands, it's going to be different. You know, everybody feels good in their comfort zone, but you know, once you get outside of your comfort zone, you get a couple of games in, you make a good play here or there, you start to feel like, you know, I can do this here, but uh, that's just what it, it takes. And I think that's why they're trying to get him some action now, even though you don't have big crowds in the stands, but these games, I mean, hey, let's face it, some of the inner squad games they're playing may be tougher competition than some of the early season games. So, you know, there's a lot of good players on that diamond. Yeah, for sure. So we talked about the, the lineup, but the rotation this year, I think is what got a lot of people excited because and it's no offense to guys like Blake Money or, or Jaden Hill or anybody like that, but LSU's kind of lacked, say, a Friday, a true Friday night starter in the SEC right. for a couple of seasons now. Paul Skeens comes in, hit 99 on the radar, and, and you know Jay Johnson said a thousand percent that he would be the Friday night starter. If he wasn't, then he shouldn't <laughs> be coaching. But right. You see a guy like Paul Skeens come in from Air Force. What do you kind of see from him, and, and can he be that Friday night guy? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, just a dominant arm and, you know, a competitor. You know, obviously he has the, uh, you know, the, the, the toughness to, to start off and, and be a player at Air Force. You know, it takes a certain type of player just to be able to get, ex you know, accepted to that school and, and certain standards they have. But he comes in, um, you know, the scouts love him. They're talking about a top of the first round type guy. And then, you know, what they've shown so far in the preseason, he's looked really well. And, 
you know, they, there's other guys on this staff that, you know, are, are almost as good. But whenever he says he's definitely our Friday night guy, I don't know that we've had that where you just had a definite guy like that for a few years. We know we've had lots of that in the past, but maybe not here in the last few years. So that's pretty exciting because if in a three game series, if you know you're, you're pretty strong on that first night, you just have to win one of those next two to win the series. And hey, if you win the series every weekend, that's that's a pretty good recipe to get to Omaha. Yeah, with a lineup like that, it's going to be very hard to beat. Whenever we talk, right, it's hard to talk to you without ever talking about your World Series home run and, and that clutch moment, right? You have a clutch gene. It's just, it is what it is. But you look at a lineup like this, hypothetically here, if someone from this lineup gets placed in your shoes in 1996, right, mm -hmm. and has to step up to the plate with a runner on third. Doesn't have to hit a home run like you did, yeah. but if someone has to go up there and deliver a base hit in this lineup, what's the one guy in this lineup that, that you would pick to be <laughs> in your spot and get that hit? Well, the goal would be it doesn't matter. You know, as Skip would say, you hold the rope. It doesn't matter who's on the other end as long as they're, you know, a teammate. But, you know, you, you would want, obviously, your top hitter. If you could have a Dylan Cruz or, you know, a Trey Morgan, one of those guys that have kind of been through the wars in the SEC before, but that doesn't always work out. I mean, that day in Omaha, I was batting ninth, you know. <laughs> I wasn't the three or four hole hitter that day. So, uh, you know, that's the goal, and, and that's kind of the mindset, I think, that any coach tries to build is, hey, it doesn't matter if, if you're the guy who's in there for your defense. If you're in the order, you got to kind of want to be that guy that's up in that situation and then see yourself coming through and then, and then make it happen. You didn't have nerves that day, did you? I did have some nerves that day, but I, you know, you, you, it's weird. You kind of like people talk about being in the zone or kind of blocking out everything. You know, you, you just get in there and you know, we're here on a high school field today. Just try to tell yourself, this is no different than when I was playing at Bolton High School. You know, it's a bigger situation, it's on TV and more people. But if you can just kind of make it simplified and, and, you know, not try to let all the stuff out there mm -hmm. and you just kind of block everything out, I think to me that was the, the best, the best uh, remedy for trying to get rid of any of those nerves. Your walk-off has been told a million times over, right? I know something that's, that's something you'll carry with you the rest of your life is, is that moment. And we've, we've talked about your story and that moment kind of leading up to it with the injury. But I was thinking about questions, you know, to talk about you in the interview, and I don't think I've ever asked this question to you specifically. Mm -hmm. After that home run, right, so the awards come with it, the, the, the fame, and, and that moment kind of lives on forever. But was there another door, or was there any other door that kind of opened following that home run that maybe something was you didn't expect, but was something that you really cherished, something special, maybe someone reached out to you, or, or maybe you, you know, got to work with an organization or anything that, that came from that moment? Um, you know, probably the, the, the coolest thing to me that just, I guess, only happened because of that moment that would have never even presented itself was, you know, you, you'll get, I would get a letter or someone would stop me months or years afterwards and tell me something like, hey, you know, I watched that game in the hospital with my dad and he was really sick, but we, we celebrated, he loved LSU, I want to thank you for that moment and, you know, they passed away soon after that. So that's kind of a last memory that they had. You know, I don't feel worthy to be able to do something like that. You know, you can't put a price tag on that. But, you know, just something like that warms my heart and almost makes you feel like, you know, if I don't do anything good the rest of my life, hopefully I do. But if I don't, I brought some joy, you know, and, and it made a difference in somebody's life. And I think as, as humans, that's that's really what God put us here for anyway, is to try to bring joy and to show his love to others. So. You know, that, I guess um, that's kind of a cliche answer, but just the fact that I was able to, you know, make a difference and people remember it years later, you know. I, I still thought it was unbelievable that, you know, my first year as a nobody minor leaguer going to uh, being on the Rangers in the big league clubhouse, some of those guys come up and they wanted to talk to me about that home run and winning the ESPY award and stuff. And, you know, these guys are on baseball cards and I've been watching them on TV. So, yeah, if I had never done that, if I pop up that day, I'm just another guy coming in there. So that, that's pretty neat looking back. That's cool. You know, kind of playing off of something you just said, you're very open about your faith and, and the way that God has kind of played that role in your life, especially put you in, in very specific moments. And I think that 1996 moment is, is one of them because you can't go to an LSU baseball game without 
the call of your home run, you know, being played through the jumbotron. Uh, if LSU ever wins a World Series or goes back to Omaha, your your hit is going to be played at some point during the broadcast, right? But I think at the end of the day, you sit back here and, and we've gotten to talk. Like I've always looked up to you as someone like that because my dad did the same exact thing. I wasn't even born. Probably weird saying that. I was. I'm sorry to say that, but I wasn't it born when, 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 when that home run was hit. But I remember my dad just talking about that moment and what that was like. Yeah. And you've been placed in so many people's lives that otherwise you probably wouldn't have even met or, or people may not have known who you were right. prior to that or even after that. But you know, you have an impact on so many other people's lives. Yeah, and I mean, I just, I, I really honestly believe that we all have a purpose. God has a plan. We don't always know what it is, but who knows if, if part of my purpose was to give people some hope to know, hey, I may be some red shirt that nobody knows of, but one day I'm going to be in a situation where things go right. I have that confident belief and, and God has it to where I'm going to be the one they remember. And, you know, I hit a home run to help my team win. Um, you know, that, 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 that brings me a lot of joy um, because there's, there's enough sadness and hopelessness out there. So uh, if anything, if I can tell that story that, hey, God has a purpose for all of us. For me, you know, one of them, hope, hopefully I got more, but one of them was to be that day in Omaha, batting ninth to come up and hit that home run just over that right field fence. And we're here 26 years later talking about it. It's the best lineup car that Skip Urban ever put together, huh? <laughs> it's got to be. That's right. Now, I got a hypothetical for you. So Gordon McKernan, right? If Gordon McKernan was popular back in 1996, do you think he would have got a call like the next day about an NIL deal after that home run? So, he he would have had to, right? So Yeah. So I have told my buddies, we came along a little too early. We missed out on all this NIL stuff. But yeah, that would have been fun to, to see how after all that, you know, you, you kind of feel like a rock star. Your team just wins the national championship. And uh, but yeah, who knows? Maybe I would have gotten a, a, a big NIL deal after that. But it, it's cool that now the, the athletes, they get all of that. And, uh, you know, they get to, you know, take care of their families and, and, and also get to play the game they love. They still get the education, which is the main reason you go to college anyway. But uh, man, I was just a little too early, I guess. But. It's got to be good Gordon, though, because what he did with LSU football, any guy that seemed to have a really good game, he was like, he had a commercial that next oh, week yeah. coming out or something like that. But <laughs> Going, staying with NIL here, if you did have access to NIL back when you played, mm -hmm. what's one place, whether it's here in Alexandria or Central Louisiana or even down there in Baton Rouge, that you're like, that'd be a fun company to do a partnership with? Is there any? Is there any one? <laughs> maybe, maybe Red River Bank. Yeah, you there know, you go. of course. But Red River Bank deal or man, anything. I, I, I'm all about TJ Ribs, so maybe they could have made a deal for go. me. But you uh, have a radio show at TJ Ribs. That's we right. Need, we need, need the Warmores radio show, uh, but. You know, speaking of NIL, it's been really cool to see what some of the LSU baseball players have done, especially the transfers, right? Yeah. They come in, they get the NIL deals, and 100% of those funds are all going towards, you know, a greater cause, whether right. it's the food bank or anything like that. And I think there was so much worry about what NIL would create. And obviously, there's still so many questions about it. But you see the hope when players like some of the guys on the team right now they are able to to do with that money yeah i mean it's just opportunity you know i, I think any opportunity that presents itself it's kind of up to us whether we take it down a dark road or make some light out of it and uh, you know obviously those guys if, if they're generous and they're able to give it to a charity or somewhere like the food bank um man then i say let, let's get as much nil money as we can out there and it's cool that now the collective has started at lsu mm -hmm. because I mean, that's kind of part of competing now is competing for athletes and you want to get the best to come to Baton Rouge and play at LSU. Well, you know, now you got to have some funds to be able to do that for NIL deals. But I think it all goes together. Um, if you win national championships, you're a winning program. People are going to want to come there. But at the same time, when the community gets behind it and it's their team and they want to, you know, have some some skins in the game, obviously that you got to put the money to put the NIL, then uh, it's just cool. You know, it's, it's part of what Louisiana is. I just have a couple more questions for you. When you played, were walk-up songs a thing? Did you have a walk -up? No, no, it was before my time. In fact, the only walk-up song, which we had no say-so on, I just remember everybody thought, well, that's real cool. Like Todd Walker would come up to bat and they play the Batman theme. Okay. I was like, oh, I get okay. it, he's the Batman, but yeah. No, they just announced So it was just him? It was yeah. just him they got to do I, it? I, well, we may have been some others. I remember him specifically. So if you played now, what would it be? <laughs> oh, gosh. 
<laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's a tough question. I'm so far out of the music <laughs> game on, on what's popular on the radio, but uh, I definitely, I, I know one, one year in Pittsburgh, I got to pick my uh, walk-up song, and for whatever reason, I love 80s, 90s music. Yeah. Uh, I just like the theme of, you know, round and round the basses, so I picked Rat, round and round. Okay. That was my walk-up song. I went with it, you know, some heavy metal people would kind of give me give me some some high yeah. fives for that but uh hey it worked i had a good rookie year i think so you, you hear walk-up songs and, and some people have the good walk-up song where like you know people are going to clap to it you know people are going to mm -hmm. get engaged other people it's like I, I get that might be your favorite song but man it, this is this is really <laughs> slow or this is like oh, I, I, know. I don't know if i can get up to to right. this music you know i don't know if anyone's yeah, intimidated I, i'm like you i think i would choose my song based on okay what is everybody going to love? And they can't wait till I come up because that's the song that's going to come it, on. Huh? Yeah, that's the way to go. I remember uh, Antoine Duplantis had a, I don't even know the name of the song, but Antoine Duplantis had a song where it's just a saxophone and it, it's just, dun, 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 dun. Everybody and it's like, like, you just got into it. I think that's, <laughs> that's what you need right there. Yeah. No lyrics, no nothing, just any of that. Um, but I, I guess now kind of, you know, looking ahead with, with, with college baseball in this season, you and I talked about Tennessee last year, right? And what Tennessee was able to do going on that run, but never even making the College World Series. Yeah. I mean, that's baseball, you know, in, in and of itself. But what does LSU have to do this season to not only have a season, I guess, kind of like Tennessee, but ultimately finish that goal and, and get to the World Series? Yeah, I mean, I think that's just it. What a learning experience. And hopefully they take a minute to stop and think about Tennessee because they were so dominant, you know, maybe as dominant as any team through the SEC schedule has been. And everybody just thought they would walk into Omaha, but they ran into a hiccup and lost in their own stadium, which nobody thought that would happen. And they didn't get there. So just to remember, you know, you, you want to have a great season, but in, in sports, you got to get hot at the end. You know, Patrick Mahomes doesn't win the, the Super Bowl if they – run into two games in a row in the playoffs where they play bad. So, you know, it, it is truly a new season. So hopefully I think they will. And, and Coach Johnson, you know, that's his job is to get them ready for the season right now and what's important now. You know, Skip always talked about WIN, what's important now. Well, winning that first series against Western Michigan is what's important now. But once you get into the regionals and the super regionals, the fact that you dominated the teams all season doesn't matter anymore. It's what can I do today to get over that team on the other side and, you know, get to Omaha. And unfortunately, there's only one team that wins the last game and you want to be that team. Absolutely. You know, one thing you've, you've always talked about, you've always credited Skip Berman for everything. And, and you know, obviously you were part of his book that he just recently yeah. released and, all, and everyone has, has loved the book so far from everything I've heard. But, you know, over the recent years, you know, what they've done was with Skip Bourbon Field, Alex Box Stadium, and obviously Skip Bourbon now has a statue yeah. and, and all of that. And it really kind of shows all the moments through his time, especially there at LSU. It must be kind of cool to see because it really comes full circle. Obviously, you're part of that piece, but to see how, you know, LSU's honored really one of the greats to ever be there, oh, it, it, yeah. it's really special. Yeah, well deserved. I mean, there's so much in college baseball. The fact that you can watch every LSU game you want to on your phone or, you know, even if it's not televised that night on TV, I think that's a lot of Skip Bertman. You know, he, he understood how if you make it into uh, a show and, you know, people want to come to games and there's more viewership that um, it's going to help college baseball. So that helps not just LSU, but all baseball everywhere. I mean, you see huge crowds and new stadiums all over the SEC. I'm biased, but I think that's Skip Bertman, you know, and, and the fact that LSU recognizes that and is honoring him with the things they've done, I think very well deserved. I mean, you know, there's not very many uh, numbers re retired at LSU, but the fact I didn't play with Ben McDonald, but everybody knows how good he is, but Eddie Furness and Todd Walker were guys that sat next to me on the bus, you know, that were at practice every day. And did we think when we were that age, we were gonna be retired or be some kind of legendary number? No. But so just just feel blessed to be able to, you know, see how things work out. And if you do the right things, you know, you get rewarded for that. So, uh, you know, it, it's cool to go back to the stadium and look up and see those numbers and see Skip's statue and remember kind of what I helped to build. And, man, I would love it more than anybody if they win 10 more championships because I'm going to be the biggest fan rooting them on. That's my last question to you is you go to games 
pretty often. If not, you're watching every game online because you right. can now. When you watch the game, are you and you're a major league, you're a former major league player as well? Are you able to watch the game truly as a fan, or do you sit there and think ah, maybe they can maybe you know they can move over here, or or maybe or do you analyze the game? A little of both. I mean, I'm still a fan. You know, uh, just the fact that I, I love to, you know, jump up and scream when they hit a big home run uh, or make a great play, but. You know, at the same time, you've played enough baseball and you kind of, you know, should they, should they, you know, take this pitcher out and put in another guy here or is this, is this a time for them to pinch hit? So you always, I think that, that's any fan, even if you haven't played Major League Baseball. So, yeah, that, that's what makes, I think, Louisiana fans so intelligent and knowledgeable about the game is they have an opinion. You know, they're not just there wondering, you know, when's this game over so I can go do something else. Uh, you know, it's not Dodger Stadium. People don't show up four hours late for the game. <laughs> yeah. So they get there early, they tailgate, and they can't wait for it. So uh, it, it's there's there's no place in college baseball like Alex Box Stadium. So, man, I'm ready for it.